Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the American Academy of Pediatrics and HealthyChildren.org. Today, we're discussing ways to help manage your child's asthma. We'd now like to introduce our host, Dr. Jennifer Hsu. Dr. Hsu is the medical editor of HealthyChildren.org, as well as a practicing pediatrician, author, and mom in Atlanta. She's co-author of Heading Home with Your Newborn and Food Fights. She's also a frequent guest on national and local television, radio, and web-based programs, and has served as the Living Well health expert for CNN.com, contributed medical information to Baby Center and WebMD, and she serves on the Parents Magazine Advisory Board. Welcome, Dr. Shu. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm really glad to be here to talk to everyone today about how to manage your child's asthma, and I'm also especially happy to be joined by our guest expert, Dr. Elizabeth Matsui. Dr. Matsui is a pediatric allergist immunologist and epidemiologist and a leading international expert on environmental exposures and their effects on asthma and other allergic conditions. She is a professor of population health and pediatrics and associate director of the Health Transformation Research Institute at University of Texas at Austin Dell Medical School. In addition, she's on the editorial board of the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology and is a fellow of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology and past chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics section on Allergy and Immunology. Uh, Dr. Matsui, thanks so much for joining us today. And here's our first question. How does asthma affect children? Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And this is a great question to start things off with. So. Asthma, first of all, is one of the most common chronic health conditions among children worldwide. So it affects about 8% of kids in the US. And it can cause mild symptoms, but absolutely can cause life threatening flares and attacks as well. And it's not just the symptoms, but it's also the kind of fallout from the symptoms, which includes missed school days as well as missed um, work for families. So there are over 13 million missed days of school each year because of asthma. Well, that is actually a very impressive number that I hadn't thought about. Let's talk a little bit about um, actually making the diagnosis for your child. So there's a common misconception that there's a, a te an asthma test or a single test to make the diagnosis. And the diagnosis is really a clinical diagnosis. And what we mean by that is it's based on the child having a pattern of symptoms that's consistent with asthma symptoms and how those symptoms respond to asthma medication. And it's also important to understand that there's not a sort of one size fit all of symptoms in children. So while wheezing is kind of a classic symptom that people think about, um, some children may have chronic cough, um, for, for example, as one manifestation of their asthma. Other symptoms can include uh, test, chest tightness as well as trouble breathing. And in addition to that, you know, really the medical history is the most important tool in the diagnosis. And so what you should expect when you go see your pediatrician, um, and there's a question about whether your child has asthma is a series of questions about those symptoms that I just talked about, but um, drilling down in, in detail to understand how much those symptoms may be affecting your child. So how often do those symptoms occur? Do those symptoms affect their daily activity? Do those symptoms wake them from sleep? What medicines or other remedies have you tried? Have they helped or not? And then also um, questions about family history. For example, is there a family history of asthma, environmental allergies, or other respiratory conditions? And then depending on the age of the child, we will ask um, children typically age five or older to do spirometry, which is a non-invasive um, lung function test. So once the diagnosis has been made, what kind of treatment might be appropriate for children who have been diagnosed with asthma? So there are two main categories of treatment. And the first category are, it's really quick relief medications. And I think this is what comes to many parents' minds when they think about asthma inhalers is the inhaler that people will carry around and use when they're having symptoms. And so this type of medication opens up narrowed airways and um, will relieve symptoms, um, you know, really in minutes after taking it. And they can also be used before exercising to prevent exercise-induced asthma. And they're 
only on an as needed basis. And the most common quick relief medication is, is albuterol, which is the generic name. Controller medications are used on a daily basis to control asthma symptoms and reduce the number of days the child has symptoms and reduce the risk of these more severe attacks or exacerbations. So they're not used for relief of symptoms. Um, and children who um, have symptoms more than twice a week or wake up more than twice a month with symptoms should be on a controller medication if they're not on a controller medication or if they're on a controller medication that suggests that the dose of the controller medication is not sufficient to control their asthma. Another consideration in terms of understanding whether a child um, needs controller medication or needs a higher dose is the number and severity of asthma attacks. And some common examples of controller medication is inhaled corticosteroids. Um, there are also combination products um, that include both the inhaled steroid component and long-acting bronchodilator, which is sort of like a long-acting version of albuterol. And those are inhalers. Um, and then there's an oral medication, um, which are leukotriene receptor antagonists. A second type of medication that, that is a kind of controller medication, but it's kind of in its own category are these biologic medications, which have really um, come online in the last 15 years or so. And they're injections and um, they have names that are hard to pronounce, but they're omalizumab and mepolizumab. And they're incredibly effective, but they are really designed for kids who um, have pretty severe asthma or having trouble controlling their asthma with the other medications that, that I just talked about. I've actually never seen a child on biologics, but I have seen kids on inhaled corticosteroids. Can you go into a little bit more detail about those? Yes. Um, so when they're used in the recommended doses, they're very safe. Um, and I know that sometimes there are concerns about side effects, and those are important questions for parents to ask, but we have a lot of good safety data about inhaled corticosteroids, and they act in a way where they um, treat inflammation um, in the lungs, and, and it's the inflammation in the lungs that sort of leads to the asthma symptoms. Um, it's possible that a doctor may recommend another type of controller medication based on the child's specific needs, though. And there's new sort of thinking about um, how best to treat asthma. And this is really hot off of the presses. So just um, this past fall, there were new asthma guidelines that came out and um, that are endorsing what's called SMART therapy, which is single maintenance and reliever therapy. And it, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's um, combining the reliever medication, the controller medication, um, so that that's the, the, the kind of approach to managing asthma. And essentially what this is, is a use of a combination of inhaled corticosteroid plus a specific kind of uh, long acting beta agonist or that bronchodilator um, that acts quickly. So it provides relief, but also acts um, for a long time called famotorol. And so with symptoms, a child would take um, two puffs of this, and they would get both the symptom relief from the famotorol as well as the long acting um, bronchodilation relief from the famotorol, as well as a dose of the inhaled corticosteroids. When and how to use this really depends on the age and the severity of the child's asthma. So, for children four years and older who have moderate to severe persistent asthma, um, this would be an approach where the child would take the um, smart inhaler. Um, every day, twice a day, and then also use that smart inhale needed for symptoms that um, would, were occurring. And then children ages 12 years and older with mild persistent asthma would just use that inhaler as needed. And so, so there are advantages because um, the, the dose of then the inhaled corticosteroid has been really titrated to the level of need, and it's also easier to adhere to that kind of medication regimen because um, your symptoms are guiding and telling you when to take it. Um, right now, you know, there, um, because it's a fairly recent approach that's been endorsed, there are questions about, you know, related to insurance coverage and then the cost of the medication. Um, and I, I expect those will be worked out over time um, as more and more you know, pediatricians prescribe this approach. 
And it does sound more convenient for patients and then it's just one medicine instead of trying to figure out, you know, multiple different Correct. inhalers. Yeah. So let's say your child is on treatment, possibly with a daily controller. How do you know if that asthma is actually well controlled? This is a great question because I think oftentimes parents are not armed with this information and being armed with this information allows for monitoring of the child's asthma and understanding before there's a big exacerbation about whether there needs to be potentially changes in the medication regimen. So well-controlled asthma usually means that your child is coughing on no more than two days per week. Um, or, and, or having other asthma symptoms no more than two days per week, waking up from sleep, from coughing, or other asthma symptoms no more than, say, once a month or no more than uh, twice for children 12 and older, uh, needing two or fewer rescue treatments or reliever inhaler treatments per week. Um, this doesn't include the pre-treating before exercise. Um, and then having no more than one exacerbation during the last 12 months. And so a, a pretty severe exacerbation is treated typically with um, an oral form of steroids like prednisone. Um, and so, so that's a marker of an exacerbation. And then able, the child needs to be able to fully participate in regular activity without any breathing limitations. Um, and so these are things a parent can monitor, but these are also what you will, when you take your child to your pediatrician, the, the kind of discussion that will be had with your pediatrician. Um, and if your child's not meeting these goals, um, then asthma action plans um, can be adjusted. And for example, maybe the dose of the inhaled corticosteroid is increased um, so you, that your child can back, be back into this well-controlled zone. Can we talk a little bit about possible triggers of asthma and how families can avoid or manage these triggers? Yeah, this is also a terrific question. So the overwhelming causes of asthma exacerbation in, in kids are environmental exposures, including viral infections. And viral infections are probably number one cause of, of serious asthma exacerbations. Um, so these are, you know, not, not easy to avoid because um, when kids are around other kids in school, then viral infections will, um, you know, flourish. And, but there are ways, you know, to try to reduce those exposures. And those include things like, you know, good hand washing. And if your child is sick, don't send them to school. Um, so they can't infect other kids. We've learned from the pandemic that things like masking and distancing and uh, paying attention to ventilation in indoor spaces really does reduce um, viral infections because um, while all of these interventions were going on to try to reduce the spread of COVID, we also saw really, really large reductions in these viral infections that um, lead to, um, uh, you know, asthma exacerbations. And then there are the secondhand smoke exposure um, is another major cause as well as other pollutants. And then indoor and outdoor allergens, indoor allergens, pets, pests like cockroaches or mice, mold, outdoor allergens include things like, you know, tree or grass pollen. And um, stress can trigger symptoms as well as cold air and changing weather. And then finally, exercise. However, I would say that we don't want to avoid exercise um, to avoid asthma symptoms. That's a sign that if you're feeling like your child's needing to avoid exercise because of asthma, that's a sign that um, their asthma is not under good control and, and really to reach out to your pediatrician. Um, indoor allergens in terms of avoidance. Um, it, it depends on the allergen, um, you know, how to best avoid that, that allergen. Um, and so that really needs to be specific to the allergen and also depending on what your child's allergic to. For pollens, keeping the windows closed, running the air conditioning, which has a natural, you know, a um, filter, which will filter out some of the pollen as it comes from the outdoor air into the indoor air. And then washing your child from head to toe when they come in at the end of the day so that any pollen that's on them does not, um, you know, get, get transferred, you know, onto furniture or in their bed. So yeah, there's so speaking, there are many, 
things that can be done. Yeah. Yeah, and with pollen, you know, in the times where we're masking now, sometimes those masks can help keep pollen out of the airways. And I do recommend um, sunglasses, both for sun protection and also maybe keeping particles out of out of kids' eyes. As another, that's a great, yeah, that's a great uh, addition. Um, we've been getting some great questions, um, and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible toward the end of this discussion. So just keep those questions coming. Um, let's talk a little bit about asthma action plan. You mentioned that a few minutes ago. What what is an asthma action plan? So an asthma action plan is essentially um, a document that is very uh, clear about what medications your child should take when. And the when part is really about what you know their level of symptoms is. And so. The reason in particular, I mean, it's helpful for everybody, but for um, kids, it helps because they are often in the care of, you know, multiple different adults or in different settings. And so it um, informs a grandparent, a teacher, um, camps, coaches, et cetera, um, how to handle asthma symptoms should they come up or a severe exacerbation. But it also includes information about what the long term daily control or medication is and what dose should be taken. Um, so here's a sample asthma action plan. Can you tell us about the green, yellow, red zones that are listed here? Yes, sure. So the, the green zone um, indicates that your child's doing well, and, and this is a zone where their asthma is under good control, and the medication that's listed there is their daily controller medication. And so they take that no matter what. And then should they start to have symptoms, and so they would move into the yellow zone. So examples of that are, and we've already kind of gone over this, but coughing, wheezing, chest tightness, waking at night. Um, and then there are specific instructions about um, how much of the reliever medication to give and how often. And if the symptoms don't return to the green zone, um, then um, instructions about what to do. And then finally, um, if the symptoms are very severe, so your child's very short of breath, the quick reliever medications are not helping, they can't do their usual activities, um, they are then in the red zone and then they receive a higher dose of albuterol or the quick reliever um, with instructions about um, you know, contacting the physician right away. So let's talk about emergency care. Some of these um, symptoms were listed in the red zone portion on the asthma action plan. Can you just describe for, for parents and other caregivers, what signs should they be looking for as a possible need to take their child to the emergency room? Yes, I think it can be very scary for a parent, particularly if asthma in your child is new to you to sort of um, understand how severe the symptoms are and what to do. And so I, these are some great kind of examples of when to when your child will need the uh, you know emergent attention. So if they can't catch their breath or speak in full sentences, obviously that the child needs to be able to developmentally speak in full sentences. Um, or walk because of breathing difficulties, that difficulties, that's an emergency. If they're using muscles in between their ribs or they're using muscles in their belly, so they're having belly breathing or in their neck, um, those are um, called retractions. So they're trying to um, help their breathing with those muscles. That's a sign that they need kind of emergent attention. If they are having a bluish or grayish color around their mouth or in their fingernails, um, that's another sign. Making grunting noisy, noises or having head bobbing and not responding to albuterol treatments and then having any change in their level of consciousness, so if they seem drowsy or confused. Um, those are um, asthma emergencies and, and your child needs to go to the emergency room immediately or um, you should call 911. I think one thing I always stress to parents of children with asthma is that it's never wrong to try to, to give a treatment. It's never wrong to take them to the emergency room. It's always best to err on the side of caution. And I think that's, you know, kind of a way of, of looking at things that parents might not be useful, used to. So thank you for, for listing all these, um, these symptoms. What about 
when is it time to change a child's treatment plan? So there are great tips here uh, on this slide. So if their um, coughing is increasing, having chest pain, they're having a decreased ability to do their usual activities, their symptoms are not responding to albuterol, but they're otherwise not in distress, which would um, mean they really have an emergency situation or they're needing albuterol treatments more frequently than every four hours, but again, not otherwise in distress, um, as we discussed on the previous slide, or not getting better after two to three days of increasing albuterol. Um, these are signs sometimes that your child might need one of those oral prednisone bursts, for example. Um, and, and that's why it's important then to reach out to your pediatrician or your asthma care provider. Great. As I mentioned, we've gotten a lot of great questions and I'm going to try to batch these a little bit and, you know, into different categories and topics. Um, following up on what you mentioned about um, possibly adding an oral steroid to a child's albuterol, what if a child is on smart therapy already? Is there ever a situation where you would add a short acting bronchodilator such as albuterol or would you just go up on the frequency of the smart therapy inhalers? So the first step is really to go up on the frequency of the SMART inhalers. There are, you know, a maximum number of puffs that the child can get in a day of those SMART inhalers, and that would be the point where you would consider it adding albuterol. But for most children, um, at that point, you know, they are likely to warrant an oral steroid burst. Okay, the next question has to do with possibly outgrowing asthma flare ups, such as kids who only have asthma or wheezing when they have a virus triggering their symptoms. Is it possible for a child to outgrow these episodes? Yes, yeah, so the, the majority of kids who only wheeze with viral infections during their sort of school period in life outgrow their, their asthma. So the vast majority of them do. Um, and of course, this is on average across a population. So it doesn't mean every single child, but the vast majority of them do. The ones who um, have other wheezing triggers or um, have allergies are um, much less likely to outgrow the, the asthma. Okay, good to know. The next question is about if a child has been diagnosed with asthma, but doesn't actually have wheezing, is that type of asthma still serious? And um, I've heard the term cough variant asthma as possibly describing this type of, of situation. So it um, has the potential to be just as serious as asthma, you know, when there's wheezing, because the child who has um, primary coughing may get a virus and then have, um, you know, a significant exacerbation where they need to go to the emergency room. Um, and so we don't really think about the severity of asthma necessarily in terms of whether someone mainly gets exercise induced symptoms or um, is coughing or um, in terms of their average severity, their baseline severity, we really think about it more in terms of what's the dose of medication that's needed to control it. Okay, great. Our next question is, um, what can we teach a child to do if they have an asthma attack, attack or flare when they are alone? So, um, by the time kids are alone without, you know, an adult nearby, they, um, you know, have reached a certain developmental stage. And so they should have albuterol with them, um, the albuterol inhaler. They should, um, you know, understand how to take it themselves. And usually by the time a child's ready to be alone without an adult around, that's perfectly developmentally appropriate. And then to also um, get in contact with an adult um, to let them know, you know, I have asthma symptoms and I took albuterol so that that adult can then assess the situation um, and determine if they're fine at that point or if there's another other action that's needed. So speaking of a child being old enough to know how to take their medicine alone, what about taking their inhaler? Um, with a spacer chamber with a mask or a mouthpiece versus 
without any of that? I, I love that question. Um, and I get it every time I'm in clinic, I think it comes up. Um, there's a, I think, misconception that's quite common that when um, someone gets is old enough where they can coordinate their inhalation at the same time that they press down on the inhaler so that the, the medication in the inhaler comes out and then they breathe in, that they don't, they're getting enough of the dose in, the, in their lungs. And that's actually not true. Um, you know, even adults are only getting part of the dose that comes out of the inhaler into their lungs um, unless they use a spacer. And so a spacer or holding chamber is it looks like a tube essentially or roughly like that. And the concept is, is if you uh, press down on the inhaler so the medication um, comes out into the tube, it's literally a holding chamber. And then um, the child can just take regular breaths and will get a full dose of the medication in their lungs. Are there any tricks to making sure that there's enough medicine delivered if you don't have a spacer available? Yeah, so in those circumstances, it's for the um, rescue medication like the albuterol, um, what I would recommend doing is you can increase the number of puffs that you take. And so as an example, you saw on the the um, asthma action plan, there were green, yellow, and red zones, and the red zones had more puffs of albuterol. Um, so you can take red zone level albuterol and you'll, you know, get yellow zone dosing roughly in a, a very sort of rule of thumb speaking. Yeah, and that's another um, situation where I say better to err on the side of caution. You know, parents say, oh, is it really safe to give six or eight puffs? And when I did a calculation a long time ago, but one of the nebulizer treatments, I believe, is the equivalent of 27 puffs of albuterol. And so giving eight or a red zone dose, for example, all at once is not going to be harmful and could definitely be helpful for a child who, who's in need. Um, our next question is, when might it be helpful to put an air purifier or a humidifier in a child's room at night? So I get this question a lot too, I bet you do too. So a humidifier will not help with um, asthma triggers. And so, um, and there's a potential downside to a humidifier because if you introduce moisture into the room, um, you can introduce mold which can be an asthma trigger, and you can um, make the environment more favorable for dust mites. And so we advise that um, families not use a humidifier. An air purifier is a little bit different. I mean, it's a filter that's intended to filter particles and other airborne contaminants um, out of the air that your child's breathing. Um, and HEPA or HEPA-like purifiers um, are great at filtering particles. And so they can be helpful for reducing um, air pollution, the, the, the particulate air pollution, and they can help uh, with some allergens. So some allergens are airborne or tend to be more airborne and some tend to be um, on larger particles. So they tend to be um, you know, in sort of set the particles settle to dependent surfaces like onto furniture or carpet. And so for allergens like dust mite, air purifiers are not so helpful because those are um, larger and less likely to be airborne. For um, allergens like pets, they may help a little bit, but if you have a pet in the home, the pets are really good allergen factories and the allergen gets into the air and um, basically it can be really hard for an air purifier to compete with the, the allergen factory that a pet is, but they, they may help reduce the levels of allergen a little bit. Okay, so we're, we've gotten a few follow-up questions um, on that, which are great. Um, keep those questions coming, although we just have a few minutes left. So um, I'm going to just move the slide to an informational slide while we finish the rest of the questions. So the next one is, you're talking about you know, particles in the air. What about those air quality indexes that talk about ozone or if there are particles such as smoke from wildfires? How does that information help families of, of children with asthma? That's a great question. So the AQI or the air quality index is um, a, a public health messaging tool um, as is implied by the question that 
lets um, the public know if the air quality is not great. Um, and, and there are different, depending on the level, there are different recommended actions. And so um, there are stages where sensitive populations, it's recommended that they, you know, not exercise outdoors, for example. Um, and, and in part, this really recommend, depends on, you know, advice from your pediatrician in a sense of how to respond, because if you have a child that has very mild intermittent asthma, um, then um, you may not want to restrict them, you know, playing in a soccer game because that's, that's a healthy activity. If you have um, someone who has more severe asthma, then staying indoors, um, you know, during the times where the air quality is not good is helpful. Wildfire smoke in particular, um, if it, it can be, um, you know, quite irritating to the airways and quite harmful. Um, and, and there's a you know, whole nother discussion about how to handle that, but that's a place where keeping windows closed, running air conditioning and things like HEPA purifiers can be helpful. And when the air is not healthy because of wildfires, it's, it's best to stay indoors. Okay, going back to what you mentioned before about pets, um, putting allergens into the environment. Are there certain pets that are better than others for kids with asthma, such as birds or reptiles? And what about allergy shots um, for preventing pets as asthma triggers? Right, so um, for many, ki many kids with asthma are not allergic to pets. And so then, you know, furry pets and all kinds of pets are, are absolutely um, fine. So what, so I think that's the first step is understanding if your child is allergic to say cats or dogs. Um, if your child's allergic to furry pets, then it's, it's better to um, think about getting pets that don't have furs, like the ones that you mentioned, um, reptiles, for example. Um, and I think, was there another question? Oh, allergy shots. That's a great question. So uh, allergy shots um, can be, or are very helpful for treating allergies. They um, may not be as effective um, when there's a pet in the home that the child's allergic to. Because again, you have this constant um, high level of exposure um, that you're trying to battle against. And I, I like to tell patients that, you know, eventually mother nature tends to win out. Interesting. What about, um, you know, there's some timely questions about COVID and um, whether COVID affects children with asthma. And then also, what is the latest research about children with asthma wearing face masks? Does that restrict their airflow? So, um, wearing a mask does not restrict their airflow at, at all. And, um, and people have actually studied that. And um, that's, I think, pretty clear. So, that's not something, you know, to be anxious or worried about at all. Um, in terms of whether asthma is a risk factor for COVID, there was a lot of concern um, when the pandemic kind of started to unfold in the earlier days that asthma was a risk factor. And what we've learned over the past year is that it's not a significant risk factor. And in fact, it's really not a risk factor at all for the kind of asthma that kids typically have, which is allergic asthma. Um, and so I think that that can help um, worried and anxious parents should should rest easy about um, that information because um, there have been many, many studies that have shown that. And so we have a lot of confidence in that information. And so the best thing that a parent can do is make sure that your child is taking their controller medications if they've been prescribed them as they've been prescribed, you know, to keep their asthma under control um, and to, um, you know, recognize that their child is actually not at any greater risk to have more severe manifestations of COVID than a child without asthma. So that's extremely reassuring. I still would recommend that all children get the COVID vaccine when they are eligible for their age, um, but it is very reassuring to know that children with asthma are not at, at greater risk for a severe illness from COVID. Um, the other thing I mentioned to families is, you know, there are many surgeons who have asthma and they wear surgical masks all day long and um, don't have restrictions in their breathing. And I've even 
demonstrated to families in my office on, on children with asthma wearing a mask and I'll, I'll check their oxygen levels throughout the visit and they're talking to me, I'll have them cough and do other things and their oxygen levels do not go down. So I think that might be reassuring for parents to hear as well. Absolutely. This, thank you so much. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn over the microphone back to our, um, our host and wrap up our presentation for today. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shu and Dr. Mutsui. That was really uh, helpful information. We also want to remind everyone um, participating today that you can register on healthychildren.org and you'll receive our e-newsletter as well as a personalized homepage for your family and special offers. Uh, also, don't forget to follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, uh, Pinterest, as well as Twitter. And we really hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Please do keep an eye out for a quick survey and let us know what you found most helpful and any suggestions you may have. And also a big thank you to our sponsor, Sanofi Genzyme Regeneron. And, um, and thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Have a great day.